Good afternoon. Um, I'm Elizabeth Sackler, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to the Center for Feminist Art and to have you here this afternoon um, for this particular lecture. The center opened in March of 2007, and in addition to being an exhibition uh, gallery or galleries that we have here, we're also an education center, and we are dedicated to feminist art and feminist activism. Activism, And our mission is to raise awareness of feminism's cultural contributions and to educate new generations uh, about the meaning of feminist art and to maintain really a dynamic uh, learning center. And we've had a very fine uh, year and a half. Uh, we have had uh, wonderful continuities of programming over the year, and uh, this particular lecture is the culmination, really, of a three-part uh, Serious. For those of you who were here yesterday, you know that Gloria Steinem's panel, Sex Trafficking and the New Abolitionists, included uh, Tiana Bienami, who is executive director of Equality Now, and Rachel Lloyd, who was the founder and executive director of GEMS, which is Girls Educational and Mentoring Services. And Jennifer uh, Cody uh, Epstein's talk today is going to add another historical dimension and cultural dimension uh, to sex trafficking and the new abolitionists, as Gloria defined it. And I'm really delighted to have Jennifer here. Um, just as an aside, I'm an avid uh, reader of the New York Times Book Review. Um, I read it every Sunday, and I have had some of my most wonderful guests emerge as a result of it. And I read the review, I don't know, however many months ago it was now, six months ago or something like that? March. Was it in March? And read the book immediately and immediately contacted Jennifer and asked her if she would come in and read from the book and discuss it. And I'm delighted that she accepted. And when she did, I realized, of course, uh, once we had Gloria's panel coming in and Sonia Osorio was here a few weeks ago. She's the uh, director of Now NYC and she was speaking about set, and the title of her talk was Sex Trafficking in Your Backyard. And so she was discussing uh, exactly what's going on in New York City regarding sex trafficking. Um, in this, in this uh, instance and today, we really have the opportunity with uh, Jennifer's book, The Painter from Shanghai. Um, she retells the story of a Chinese prostitute turned post-impressionist painter and uh, a little bit about Jennifer. Her fiction has appeared in several literary magazines. She has lived and worked in the United States, Japan, China, Hong Kong, Thailand, and Italy for publications including the Wall Street Journal, the Asian Wall Street Journal, Mademoiselle, Self, and Parents, as well as for the NBC and HBO networks. She has a master's in international relations from John Hopkins University and an MFA in fiction from Columbia University where she is an adjunct professor uh, in the School of Arts. She lives in Brooklyn, which of course makes us all very happy at the Brooklyn Museum to have an artist or writer come in from our uh, borough uh, with her husband and her uh, two daughters. And uh, Jennifer, will, there will be a book signing in the museum uh, gift, gift store uh, after the reading, uh, and Jennifer will be signing and selling uh, books. So I'd like you to uh, join me in welcoming uh, Jennifer Cody Epstein. I'm going to just uh, first give a little bit of background on Pan Yulong because um, I certainly had not heard of her before I undertook this and sort of rather ambitious endeavor over 10 years ago, and uh, most people that I've spoken with also had not heard of her. So um, just a little bit of background. Um, she um, was, the, the details on her life were actually somewhat sketchy. I suspect that she had a very lot of control over um, the details of her life, uh, somewhat understandably given what that, you know, those details include. But um, according to several sources, she was born in 1895. Um, and uh, her family name was actually Chen at that point. Chen Chuqing seems to be the name that 
um, people believed that she had. She was the daughter of artisans, um, a small family, um, but fairly successful that um, made a living out of embroidering hats. So she had some background in embroidery um, from her mother. Um, her parents both died when she was eight. She went to live with her uncle, who like many people at that time, in large part thanks to the West, was an opium addict. Um, and he sold her into a brothel when she was about 14. Um, she was bought out after several years by Pan Zhanghua, who was a young follower of Deng Xiaoping and um, was a young Republican tax official. Um, she became his concubine, which officially was not legal at that point, but many officials continued to do it. Um, and because this generated a lot of rumor and buzz um, where they were in Wuhu at that time, uh, she ended up going to Shanghai um, to kind of escape the rumors and create some distance. Um, it was there that she entered the Shanghai Art Academy in 1918. This was one of the very first modern art schools in China. It was founded by Lu Hai Su, who was another sort of pioneering uh, painting master. There were a series of, of painters, including Pan Yulang and uh, Zhu Bei Hong, who fused Western and Eastern art together um, in very new and interesting ways. And I think that they were sort of among the first people to be doing this in China. And she sort of fell under his tutelage. Um, and did very well. In 1920, she ended up getting a scholarship to Lyon University in France on the strength of her painting. From there, she went to the Beaux-Arts in Paris, and she studied there as a, a quote-unquote free student. There's a French way of saying that, but my French is atrocious, so I won't, I won't try. Um, officially, she wasn't on the roster. I had a, a researcher there sort of confirm that she's not actually in um, the archives as an official student. But um, like many students, she probably was just attending classes when she could get into them um, and got obviously a very great education from that because her painting really bloomed. Um, she was mentored in Paris by Zhu Bei Hong, who was um, a rival of Lu Hai Su, a little bit like Matisse and Picasso. Um, very, very vitriolic relationship and they put each other down whenever they could in the newspapers, but they both had very um, bold, interesting art. She came back to China in 1927 and tried to create a life for herself, painting what she had learned to paint um, in the past couple decades. Largely, um, this was comprised of nudes, and because she couldn't find, um, at that point, in a very Confucian-oriented society, people to model for her, she would paint herself using mirrors. And um, I'm sure somewhat by design, this was very controversial, and for a while she was quite popular, but. Um, as um, civil war sort of bloomed, uh, the, there was a right-wing um, sort of backlash against modernist values and European aesthetics, and her work came mm -hmm. under very open criticism and sometimes actually under physical attack, which was um, pretty devastating to her. Um, she continued to teach um, and to live and to paint in Shanghai and Nanjing until 1937. For a while, she lived with uh, Pan Zhanghua and his first wife, which by all accounts was pretty unpleasant for everybody. Um, and then one of her, her um, exhibitions in Shanghai was, was um, vandalized and a work that she cared a lot about was destroyed. Um, and that marked sort of uh, the beginning of sort of her, the end of her experiences in China. She left in 1937 ahead of the Japanese invasion of Nanjing and she lived out the rest of her life in self-exile in Paris. Um, as most people know, in 1949, the communists took over China, um, which uh, had some very um, positive impacts on a lot of things. It did not have a particularly positive impact on Pan Yulang's kind of art because it was denounced as very um, degenerate. Um, so she ended up staying in, in uh, Paris, uh, never taking citizenship, always hoping to go back, um, exhibiting at the Salon, the French National Art Exhibition, the Salon des Independences. Um, in 1945, she won a gold, um, the gold award at the Salon des Independences. As I said, I don't speak French very well, so apologies for mauling that. Um, and her work was also exhibited um, in the Paris Museum of Modern Art. Um, so she, she had quite a, um, a good reputation in Paris, um, although she never became more than modestly successful um, in the commercial sense, and she died, by most accounts, in, in poverty in 1977. Um, she's buried in Montparnasse uh, Cemetery, and um, the legend is that she, uh, she was buried wearing Chinese clothes because she wanted to, to underscore her Chineseness. Um, and her legacy is more than 4,000 works of art. Um, and these include sculptures, sketches, oil paintings, watercolors, traditional, fauvist. Uh, she, just, she just tried everything. She was voracious with her art. 
Um, and after I do my reading, I'm going to try and show you a little bit of a sample of some of the works that I've been able to find. Um, and her legacy also, as I mentioned in my afterward, included continued controversy because as recently as 1993, um, one of her exhibits in Beijing um, had to be edited, censored, because the nudes in it were causing such an outcry. So she continues to be a much discussed and I think very important character um, in Chinese modern art and I would say in, in feminist art in general. Um, I'm going to read uh, from two sections of my novel. Um, the first section is taking place when she is at the Shanghai Art Academy um, studying under Lu Haisu. She ran into some trouble initially while she was there because while her coloration and her technical skills were outstanding, she had a large amount of trouble initially painting nude bodies, which I think given her background um, is sort of fascinating. And the fact that she ended up overcoming this and making sort of the, the traditional impressionistic nude sort of the basis of her art, I think, is, is a tremendous um, statement of her determination and her strength. And part of what I was trying to do in this section was understand how that came about, how she was able to conquer these insecurities um, and sort of the scars of her past to paint such beautiful nude paintings. So. A week later, Yilong still hasn't been to a class but she is at least finally working. Inspired or shamed by Lu Haisu, she's racked her brain and her contacts and finally found a model to meet her requirements. It took nerve, determination, and two mortifying refusals, but when the solution came, it seemed at once both pure genius and sheer insanity. She started that very same afternoon. Now she chews a cuticle, studying her subject. I'm supposed to live in you, she tells the girl. That's what teacher Hong has said. Her model stares back balefully. Goosebumps sprinkle her bare thighs. Yilang rubs her own arms. It is chilly. The dorm that she's moved into, both because it's close to school and because it allows her to avoid Qi Hua and A Ying, those are two other people from her household, uh, while she works, prohibits charcoal braziers. For good reason. Last year, more than 30 girls in a similar dorm had died in a midnight fire, pounding on a door, bolted to keep them safe. Setting her teeth, Yilang mixes her flesh tones, violet, yellow, earth red, fine black, Venetian red. She creates a quick and expert outline of the body's shape on her canvas, and then she loads her brush and begins to fill it in. As she works, she doesn't let herself think or question. She just paints stolidly, methodically, modeling in the peach-tinged curves, the beige shadows, when she reaches the breast, she hears Godmother's voice. That was the Madame from the brothel. If they touch the breasts directly, charge seven extra, ten for the feet. Hush, you old bitch, she mutters and moves on to the hips, the belly, the puckered kiss of the navel. She is just backing up to fill up some hair some more when the clamor erupts outside. A funeral is in progress on the street. At first, Yilong tries to work through it, but it's no use. The mood is broken. She sets her brush in her jar and throws on her shawl against the cold. Walking to her desk, she uncorks the wine that she's taken to sipping as she works. She pours a glass, and then she walks to the open window. The coffin is set just outside the house across the street. The deceased must have died away from home. But there is no shortage of mourners. The daughters are dressed in black, grandchildren and great-grandchildren in blue. The son-in-laws wear stark white and bright yellow. Underscoring this colorful chorus of bereavement is the clicking of the pat cha dice. The morning gong hung to the right of the house's doorway signifies that the departed is a woman. The presence of great-grandchildren means that she was probably quite old. But Yulang is too far away to make out the portrait that's propped on a stool by the coffin, amid layers of flowers and other offerings. She tries to recall the grandmothers who greet her sometimes when she comes home. One has a face like a withered pumpkin and a sweet and oddly young voice. She sometimes calls out to Yilong, going to school, little daughter? When are you going to paint my picture? Yilong imagines this same woman now, lying still in her coffin with her face and her body covered by yellow and blue cloth. What would it be like to paint that in life study, a body that has no life in it at all? Her anatomy class works from textbooks and an old medical skeleton donated by the Mission Clinic because it's missing two ribs. But Leonardo is said to have learned from the actual dead, spending hours in darkened morgues, dissecting, peeling back, 
sketching. Her classmates, raised to see death as the ultimate contaminant, were openly horrified by this. Yulango had merely shrugged, at least inwardly. She couldn't help but think that if the Italian master had simply taken up the flesh trade, he'd have gained just as firm a sense of human physiology. Now she studies her model again, the hardened nipples, the goosebump skin, and the sight of her like that, stripped alone, hurts her heart. Yulang shuts her eyes and then berates herself in silence. Stupid whore. You can't paint her if you can't see her. And then, just like that, it hits her. I can't see her. Electrified, she opens her eyes, Teacher Hong's words coming back with a new meaning, try to see the skin as more than simply skin, he had said. As advice, it is directly and fully at odds with that that Jin Ling once gave her. It's just skin. And yet, studying her model again now, Yu Lang suddenly realizes that her troubles, then and now, arise from her own failure to see skin as either more or less of itself, to see it outside of a spectrum of pain. In her old life, it was a liability, a soft surface waiting for wounds. As such, at the academy, it inspires not creative passion, but a wave of remembered revulsion. And in both places, she's been unable, as hard as she might try, to see it as beautiful, as something worth painting. Outside, the mourners wail, Ay, come back, mother, come back. Her heart racing, Yulang shuts her eyes once more. She thinks of Jin Ling, uh, that was her mentor at the brothel, not in death as she was the last time that Yulang saw her, but in those impossibly early days when Yulang had first begun to attend to her before she fully understood a body's worth in monetary terms and could value it only in the currency of beauty. She thinks of the way that Jin Ling's skin had looked in the early morning, sheened in perspiration, stretched out in sheer joy, limbed in the early light of a sunrise. Beauty, she thinks, and she looks again into the mirror. And perhaps it's the timing, the sun is finally setting, touching everything in the room with orange and gold, but at that moment, Mirror Girl strikes her as almost ethereal, as far from mere skin as a rainbow is from rain. Yulang stares at herself, her thin thighs, her curving hip, and for the first time in years, she truly sees herself. She sees herself as finally free of the broker's probing fingers, of strange men's hands, of the jewelry that binds it, debt-like, a chain-like to debt. Picking up her palette, she hurriedly paints out the stiff first image. She cocks her head, takes a breath, and starts anew. She paints until the light outside has seeped away into the black sky, until the monks go home and the mourners leave, and all that's left is the soft click of the gambler's ivory. Um, the next section that I'm going to read um, is going to um, take place in Paris. Um, in her early days, I was trying to imagine how she ended up as a free student. Um, at the Beaux-Arts and what her interactions with Zhu Bei Hong, who was a notoriously flamboyant young man in Paris at that point, must have been like. Um, and this scene is sort of what I came up with. Um, in it, uh, she is meeting him for the first time. She's asked him for some advice and some help because she wants to stay on in France. Um, at this point, um, most of her scholarship money has been cut off, as it was for many Chinese students. There were many, many Chinese students studying in Europe at this point, but as the country became more enmeshed in civil war, um, the Republican government began to cut those funds, and so many of them were just left penniless. Um, so. Zhu Bei Hong is nearly a full hour late for their appointment the next day, but he makes no pretense of an apology. Instead, in a regal motion that's oddly in keeping with his red velvet coat, he waves down a passing waiter, he requests a café noisette for himself and adds half of a pitcher of milk to the coffee. He plunks in several sugar cubes. Observing him, Yulang notes his soft chin and his full lips, both at odds with a broad, strong nose. Jin Ling, she thinks, would have liked this man's face. She would have said that his nose predicted strength in finance, his lips and chin a weakness for pleasure, a fortuitous combination at the hall. So, the artist says, sipping his milky beverage, you want to study here, but your letter implies complications. These explain it better than I could. Yulang removes the other two notes that she had stored in her novel on Tolstoy. 
One is her Kurt Bozart's rejection notice, and the other is even curter, a communique from the Anhui government notifying her that both her scholarships have been withdrawn. The young artist scans first, one, then the other. Yulang settles back to study Parisian cafe culture, something that on her last brief trip here she had no time for. It is indeed a far cry from Lyon. As she watches, a man dressed in a Harlequin costume prances past, delivering a note to a girl who is sitting across the room. The girl reads it and blows a languid kiss to the note sender. She is dressed in what looks like a man's military uniform, her poodle tucked like a purse beneath one arm. Between its golden hair clips and monkey fur trimmed little sweater, the dog is decidedly better dressed than its owner, or, Yulang thinks dryly, herself. You are with the new Sino French Institute, Zhu Hong is asking. Yulang forces her attention back to the table, uh, just for six months before I transferred to the art academy in Lyon. Long enough to tire of grammar drills and endless lessons on table manners, I'd assume. He drums his fingers. Were you there for the demonstrations? Um, Sorry, I should mention this too. The, um, there was a contingency of Chinese students at Lyon University that actually took over the university um, in, I believe, 1918, right after Yulong would have gotten there. Um, they were demanding uh, that the school create space for them because it had essentially promised that it would and then it, it did not. So um, sort of the early stirrings of, of political activism. And many of these demonstrators went back to join the revolution, the communist revolution in China. You participated, Zhu asks now. No, but I supported them, and as he lifts an eyebrow, they were in the right. The Chinese consul told them he'd guarantee their admission. Well, from what I've read, that's not his story now. Yulang sets her cup down. Then he's a coward and a liar. Her companion looks amused. Shouldn't you be careful? For all you know, he might have friends here in this cafe. Well, if he does, they're not friends of mine. Still, Yulang casts another glance around. The dark young woman is now feeding her poodle almond pastry, shredding it with gold-painted fingertips before pushing the bits between the dog's black gums. Do you ever honey your words? Su Beihong is asking, reaching again for the sugar. Well, I did it one time, but I've learned that you can't paint with honey. He smiles, a slow, warm grim that's grin that seems to illuminate the air around him. Bravo, you'll do well here, mademoiselle. Madame, Yulang corrects him. That's right, he says, without interest. Patting his pockets, he pulls out a tarnished cigarette case. This stuff about the consul, he says, flicking a gawa into his mouth and putting the case back without offering it to her. You heard it directly? Yulang nods. A friend of mine from the academy came to Lyon from the Montargis faction, faction, and he said he'd been lied to. They all did. I believed them. She laughs, remembering, although at that point I barely believed I was in France yet. And this friend, he was one of the uh, radicals. He was a student, like me, or anyone else. Yulang had been going to say, like you, but even though the young artist graduated from the Beaux-Arts just last year, she senses that he'd bridle at the suggestion that they're contemporaries. Zhu Beihong has, after all, already shown in two salons. He's a protege of the realist Dagnon Bouveret. It's just that the government had taken away his stipend, she continues, his job. He worked in an auto factory there, paid less than a living wage, let enough alone for schooling. It left no time to study in any case. She stares into her coffee. It's excellent, cleanly bitter, far stronger than the black-tinged brew that she's allowed herself since her funds were cut off. It's hard for us all, Zhu Beihong is saying, sipping his sugared sludge. We didn't come here like rich Americans to drink and eat and, da eat and dance Le Charleston all night. He nods towards a table of them, speaking loudly in their twanging Yankee voices. We have to make our own way. We have to work. He was trying to get into a course that would let him both live and study Yulang protests, and he failed. The, the system failed him. It failed all of us. Yulang eyes him evenly. It's clear that he is bored now by this subject. She picks another, which she expects he will like more. Is it true that you've been accepted into the next salon? Predictably, the artist's frown inverts into a small, smug smile. Four paintings so far, and five more that they're deliberating on. He leans back expansively. But I want to hear more of you. How did you manage to transfer to the Lyon Beaux-Arts so quickly? Principal Lu Hai Su had helped to set up the arrangement. He had an acquaintance there. Lu Hai Su. Zhu pronounces the name as though it rings a distant bell, and Yulang suppresses a small smile. In Shanghai, Zhu Beihong and Lu Hai Su are all now almost famous as rivals, as Picasso and Matisse are here in Europe. It's even said that when Lu Hai Su started his Heavenly Horse Painting Society in Shanghai, Zhu Beihong counter-launched his own painting society here, the Heavenly Dog Society, so named because dogs eat horses. 
Having met Zhu Bei Hong, Yulang now fully believes this story. It's about the lever level of hubris you'd expect from a man wearing red velvet. So Monsieur Lu pulled some strings to get you in at Lyon, he's saying now, but I take it they don't reach to Paris. He sounds distinctly pleased by this fact as he picks up the other letter, Yulang's Beaux-Arts re Beaux rejection. Respectable performance, particularly in coloration, he translates with an ease that makes her envious. Well, that's not so bad. Many people don't even survive the entrance. It's still three days of exercises, perspective, portraiture, architectural drawing, etc. Yulang nods. I, I think I did all right up until the oral part. Grilled in Renaissance art history by a man who might have sat with Marat on the revolutionary tribunals, she'd felt her, felt her French disintegrate, hard one word by hard one word. Everything she'd memorized, phrases, dates, architectural jargon, had vanished like so much candied rice paper on her tongue. Which old fart was it, Sue asks now? Lambor, Lamboradel, something like that. Ah, oui, Claude Lamboradier, he rolls his eyes. A negligible talent, he got his job because he exhibited with Bizarro in the old days which of course is ironic, since Pizarro didn't even go to the Beaux-Arts. He glances at the portfolio that has been leaning against her leg throughout their talk. Yulang had lugged it here from her pension this morning, despite a fear that this would seem formal. May I, he asks. Yulang nods, her mouth suddenly as dry as the cardboard folder itself, as Zhu Behong leafs through its contents, his cigarette dangling from his pursed lips. The problem, she tells him, suppressing a surge of anxiety, is that even if the Beaux-Arts had accepted me, I'd still need a scholarship. The government has cut my stipend off, too. They're cutting off everyone's. I guess they need every bit of gold to fight against the warlords. Pausing over a Cezanne-esque landscape, the young artist chuckles. Thankfully, it's not over her works. No one born abroad will ever get a centime from the Beaux-Arts, he said. It's like trying to pull ivory out of a dog's mouth. He shifts through several more pieces, staring at each with a practiced intensity, before finally stubbing out his second half-smoked cigarette. Very impressive, he says at last, sliding the folder back towards her legs. Though I would urge you to take yourself to the Louvre immediately for a healthy dose of Proudhon, Delacroix, and Rembrandt. What you must focus on is form. That's the meat of art. You paint with honey, after all, Madame Pan. He waves at another waiter, one carrying a small tray of tarts. Speaking of food, how important is it? Excuse me? You're about to move to the culinary capital of Europe. Some would say the world, although I have to say I wish that they would use more salt. Lifting the pitcher, he dumps what's left into his cup. A bit splashes, less a drip now than a milky shadow of one. By the way, he adds, lowering his voice conspiratorially, never salt your foie gras. No matter how bland it tastes, it's rude. It's like taking the last dumpling. He conveys the sloshing cups to his lips, sips, and adds, you think I'm joking. About the foie gras? No, about the food. Well, are you? Yulang says it with a hint of annoyance. She hasn't the faintest idea where this conversation is leading. And for all of her hopes of a free meal, he, her host hasn't even looked at the menu. Think about it, he says. What's more important, a good painting or a good slab of beef? Or for that matter, one of those loud poire dresses my wife is always pointing at. The answer comes without hesitation. A painting, of course. He grins again, that liquid, slow beam. And again, Yulang feels an absurd flash of pleasure. He is, she suddenly realizes, a man who flashes his charm like a swordmaster. It is his secret weapon. Justement, he says. The steak will fill you for a day. The dress will win you compliments, at least from my wife, for a week. But in 10 years' time, or 100, what you've made here, he indicates the portfolio, will remain. Your children, your children's children, will see it. You have children. The waiter arrives. Zhu Hong hands him the creamer, although Yulang wonders why. By this point, he barely has any coffee left. Not yet, she looks away. But I do need a little food to live on, don't I? A little, Zhu Hong concedes as the waiter materializes again to replace the tiny cream pitcher with a flourish. And as you'll discover, a little in Paris costs much more than a little elsewhere. Bi Wei and I moved to Berlin for a while last year, thinking it would be cheaper. He pops a sugar cube into his mouth. Of course, prices were rising there at a rate beyond comprehension. You've heard how it was. He crunches, swallows audibly. Bread cost a mark or two at the war's end. It cost 200 billion marks or more by the time we left. Our friends with jobs were getting paid two or three times daily just to keep up with inflation. But even then, they had to race to buy the basic things. He shakes his head fondly as though this recollection were one of the happier ones of his trip. Things are better now if you have talent, if you know a few tricks, no bonbons, no fancy hats or shoes. On some days, maybe even many days, no dinner. Do all of this and you'll get along, as I have. Here he breaks into a hacking, chest-deep cough that for some might have undermined this last point. 
The waiter appears like a genie, a glass of water on his tray. As for the school, Zhu Hong goes on after a sip or two, at heart they still don't want anyone who's not born here. When they do accept them, they give them extraordinary posts, not full student status. Those they leave for the full-blooded Frenchmen, those few who are left after the war, of course. He finishes his water. And you know, of course, that even if you win the school's highest competition, the Prix de Rome, you won't get the prize or the purse. Finishing off his coffee, he signals the waiter and, in French, that is virtually as free of shame as it is of an accent, requests a small pot of hot water. Then he turns back to Yulong. So don't build that into your budget, he adds in Chinese. The waiter returns with a steaming teapot. Anything else, monsieur? No, thank you, André. The young artist produces from his jacket pocket a hard roll that looks suspiciously like those that Yulong had just seen outside, left on the tables by paying customers. As he dips it into the milky mixture, she stares at her place setting, remembering those first dreary weeks in Lyon. Small fork for salads, big fork for meat, knife for cutting meat, not butter, spoon for soup or ices, but never for the dinner plate. And don't lick it when you use it. And don't touch any of the utensils before you plan to use them. Somewhat defiantly, she picks up her soup spoon, studies it. What she sees is her own face, clouded, upside down. My husband wants me to come home, she says abruptly. My wife wants me to stop buying paintings, he replies affably. My gallery wants me to pay its commission. The world will always want us to spend differently, to think differently. He jabs his finger at her. What is it you want? To stay. The answer wells up fully a small part of her soul. I want to live here, to paint here. I want nothing more, but if the Beaux-Arts won't take me, they'll take you. She stares at him. How? I didn't pass the entrance examination. There is more than one entrance to the rabbit's burrow, if you know where to look. Have you heard of the free students? They're alternates, effectively, but if you're disciplined and if you form a good relationship with the maître de Sasson, which is the head of the, um, the session in the atelier, you can get every bit of as good an education as any Frenchman. He finishes the bread, wipes his slim fingers on his napkin. And while I can't get you a scholarship, I can help you to find cheap lodging. You wouldn't need to pay much. Of course, if it's not what you want, well, no, Yulang forces a smile. It's, it's so much more than I deserve. I would be so grateful. He nods beneficently. All I'd ask in return is that you keep me in mind if you happen to meet anybody useful. Useful? Oh, critics, important painters. No picture dealers, though. If you ask me, their goal is to squeeze the life from art as we all know it. Scanning the room, his face suddenly brightens. Hello, Fujita, he shouts at a couple that's just been seated. The darker and more diminutive of the women turns to face them, and it's only then that Yulong sees that it isn't a woman at all. It is rather an oriental with a severe haircut, owlish glasses, and glittering golden hoops in each ear. He waves back at Zhu Beihong, then turns back to his companion. Fujita Suguhara, Beihong, Beihong offers, turning back to face her. That's Fujita? The man, Yulang notes, is also wearing lipstick. Expensive lipstick, from the look of it. In the flesh, as they say, he calls himself Leonard here. Zhu signals the waiter. His painting's a bit bland for me, lots of skinny girls and cats, but his lines are lovely, and of course, he's very well connected. He's also clearly successful. As Yulang watches enviously, the Japanese artist picks several tarts from a passing pastry cart. To her own horror, her stomach growls loudly. She crosses her arms over it quickly. Are you all right? Zhu is watching her with amusement. What? Oh, of course. She fights back a flush. I, I was thinking about that old saying about not being able to draw a cake and eat it too. He grunts, one of Biwei's favorites. I often heard it in Berlin. And what did you tell her? Zubei Hong pulls his fragile frame slightly straighter. That if I give up my art, I'll end up eating my dreams. And dead dreams are worse than hunger. They're poison. He holds her gaze for a moment, and then he licks his teaspoon, crunching its last granules of sugar with clear relish. So that's, the, uh, that's the reading. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and now I'm going to attempt to use PowerPoint for the very first time in my life. Um, I have brought um, some pictures of Pan Yulong, um, of some of her mentors, and um, just sort of general informational pictures as well as her own paintings. It was a, uh, what do I hit again? <laughs> Escape? Okay. And then this one? Okay. And then I use um, these here, right? Okay, great. Is this the first one? Yeah. 
Okay, so that's actually a photo of Pan Yulong. Um, I believe that this was from when she was still uh, in China, although I'm not sure. A lot of these aren't actually dated or not dated accurately. There's another one. That is um, one of her self-portraits. This is actually the portrait that I, that really started this whole endeavor for me. I was at the Guggenheim Museum um, with my husband seeing an exhibit um, on modern Chinese art and this painting was on the wall and uh, it just really drew me over because it was so unlike anything else that was in that museum at that time. I mean, there were lots of sort of sketching, ink and draws, sort of uh, poetry pieces, and there were some big propaganda posters, but there was nothing like this. And um, I saw it and I read her short biography and just was blown away. So that's what set everything in motion. That's Pan Jamwa, her husband. It's a sketch that she drew, obviously. I haven't translated, haven't had translated the um, little poem on the side, but I'm sure it says something nice about him. Uh, that's, that's Pan Jamwa's son, who became her adopted son, and um, from what I understand, is still living in Anhui province today. I was not able to get in touch with him, although I did try. This is um, a painting that I actually use in the preface of the novel. I, I sort of used a lot of her paintings to try and get insight into what her character might have been like, and I really loved this one. Um, she has a lot of motherhood themes. She never actually had children of her own, although most um, anecdotal accounts say that she was pregnant at least once. This was going to be on the cover of um, my novel in the United States, but we couldn't figure out who actually owns the uh, secondary rights to it, so we decided not to take the risk. But it's one of my favorite paintings of hers. And this is a watercolor. But you can see she uses so much Western style texture, cross hatching, sort of really interesting techniques that were very new to her, I'm sure, in the back. And what years are these? These are sort of spanning from, I think one of them's 1925 up to 1945. This one, I think, is 35. And I, I do one of my scenes sort of based around this one, too. She had a couple that were sort of luminous nudes like this, and I just thought they were really beautiful. Her colors are very, very bold in some of them. This is another motherhood theme one. Um, again, it's just got very bold Chinese lines, but a sort of more almost Fauvist expression. And I'm, I'm sort of interested by the fact that the baby has no face. I think that that's kind of telling. It's another, another nude. I actually tried to repaint this as part of my quest to understand oil painting, and I really made a bungle of it, but uh, it was interesting to just kind of see how she'd, how she'd worked. Whoop, sorry, it shows up twice. That's one of her still lifes. Um, she did a lot of flowers and fruit. This is another fan dance picture. That's another self-portrait. And she never, with the exception of one painting of herself that I've seen, um, she always has this very distant sort of pensive look on her face, which I think is sort of part of her intrigue for me. It just really made me very curious about her story. That's uh, relatively later on in her life. It's a painting of war. Um, I don't think it's, it's quite as, she seemed to do better in my mind with um, beauty, with themes of beauty, but I think that she was very, torn apart by what was happening to China, um, both during World War II and then afterwards. This um, is a bather's painting, um, and I, again, I think that this may have been done in the 30s, but what strikes me about it is um, that's Matisse's famous bather's painting, and I feel like you can really see, I mean, down to the positions where she's, they're, they're sort of the angle of their heads, the, the fact that the third character is, um, has her back turned, it just strikes me that she's, she's really experimenting with the things that she's seeing around her at this point. Um, again, this, this sort of seemed evocative Matisse, of Matisse to me. Cezanne, Cezanne thank you. <laughs> the peaches, right. This is actually one of Lu Hai Su's landscapes. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to show, show that. That's Lu Hai Su himself painting um, in a class at the Shanghai Art Academy probably in the uh, early 30s. And you can see that there's a nude standing right up there. And there's actually, um, there, was, there were a number of women in the classes, which is also 
sort of interesting for the times. That's one of Pan Yulang's sort of more traditional, she went through periods where she'd really explore more traditional art forms. Um, and oftentimes these were horses, and that was interesting to me because, uh, oops, well, I had a picture of Zhu Bei Hong's in there. He was also very well known for his horses. That's the, um, the movie that was actually made out of um, the one source that seems to be around on her life, and it's a very controversial source, but it was um, a series of articles, um, sort of fictionalized um, bio biographical articles that was written under a pseudonym in a Chinese art magazine in the 1980s. And um, eventually they were put into a, um, a novel in China by the, the magazine itself. And um, there were symposiums trying to figure out who the, the writer might have been. Nobody really ever figured it out. But um, the story is that, that they were based on discussions that Pan Yilong had had with her daughter-in-law and then the daughter-in-law supposedly passed these stories along to whoever the writer was. And again, I've, there's been lots of uh, debate as to how authentic it is, but they're really, it's the only real source out there that people seem to fall back on. This is one painting of herself that has her smiling, which I think is sort of interesting. This was done later in Paris. Um, I think it might have been even as late as, as the early 50s, I'm not sure. Um, but you know, by contrast to all the other sort of somber, sad pictures, she's actually painted herself looking content and obviously pretty relaxed here, so. <laughs> yeah, that helps, right? <laughs> this is in, um, most of her work now is in the Anhui Provincial Museum in Hefei. Um, they, Hefei, China, which is an Anhui province in China. Um, that was where she was from originally, and, and she bequeathed her art to China um, before she died, and, and it all, most of it ended up at this museum. Um, this is a relatively new wing in the museum. It wasn't around when I first started researching, and I, again, had written them several times, asking them if I could come. I sent a researcher to sort of knock on their door and try to take pictures. At that point, everything was being um, sort of categorized and, and um, cataloged in the basement, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't let us near it. So, you know, I, I don't know whether they're supportive or not of my project, but I'm hoping to get there at some point. And that's a that's the same painting that you saw at the museum being looked at by a, a modern day Chinese person. And I think that's it. So. Well, what year was the, um, the photographs, the models, of the new models actually made the models actually? I would say that was probably in the 1920s. Right. They, they, yeah. They were both Certainly, if they were male models, models. I know. It, I know that that continued for a long time. Yeah. I mean, I think um, there certainly was an outcry. I think that in there are different stories. Some stories say that she was the first woman to get into the, the Shanghai Art Academy, but again, that's hard to confirm. I'd also heard that there were a couple other female students there when she was there. Um, I think, by all accounts, Lu Hai Su was pretty progressive. So um, he. My guess is he probably would have allowed the women in, at least to paint the men, I mean, the, the other women. I know that, that um, when Yulong went to the Nanjing um, Central University, which is, she got into some trouble at Shanghai Art Academy. I think she slapped a colleague for calling her a prostitute or something. And she left and went to work in Nanjing under Zhu Bei Hong. And she sort of caused another scandal because um, to sort of, uh, protest the fact that women were not allowed into the classes where male nudes were posing. She dressed up as a man and went in and painted, <laughs> painted one of the male nudes. Um, and that caused, caused a bit of an outburst. So, and I think that would have been in the early 1930s. Are there any more questions? that I was influenced by? Yeah. Um, sure, I mean, they, they're trying to think of, um, you know, the first one that comes to mind, strangely enough, is Dave Eggers, who, who wrote um, his second, second book was called What is the What? And um, it was based on um, a narrative story by a um, Sudanese refugee who he'd actually sat down with and worked with, and all the proceeds are going to help 
you know, the, the victims of the civil war in Sudan. Um, you know, certainly there were, there were others. Um, you know, I think it was more, it wasn't simply um, biographical fiction, it was also just historical fiction in general that really, um, really impressed me. And um, I've always, always loved it. I mean, everything from Edith Wharton, you know, on has been, you know, just really interesting to me. Um, so there was um, one really terrific novel that was recently translated into, a, into English by the University of Columbia Press. And um, I found it really just riveting. It's by a, a Chinese writer who apparently is very prolific and popular in China, but I'd, I'd never heard of him. His name is uh, Ye Zhaoyan, and he wrote a novel, interestingly enough, about Nanjing on the eve of the Japanese invasion. And he set that scene um, against a, a love story, which is so improbable, but it was, and it's also, strangely enough, a very funny book, which you would not think anything you know, set against the rape of Nanjing would, would be. But um, that, just the way that he used details and um, sort of the fearlessness which, with which he sort of took over that world was very inspiring to me. Largely by reading. I mean, I took um, a number, I was at Columbia's MFA program at the time, and I was able, very luckily, to take um, classes you know, in different departments. So I took a number of Chinese history classes, and um, Professor uh, Zalin, Madeline Zalin there, um, is the head of the East Asian Studies Department, and she gave me some suggestions for books that, that actually, there's two books in particular that focus on prostitution in China during this period. There's one by Sue Gronwald, called Beautiful Merchandise, and another one um, called uh, Dangerous Pleasures by um, Hershatter, Gail Hershatter. Um, so I, I, I read those pretty, pretty carefully and intently, took a lot of notes. Um, I read materials on prostitution in general. I was sort of interested yesterday, they talked about the Mustang Ranch, and I'd actually read you know, a memoir that came out of the Mustang Ranch to try and get a sense of you know, just the, the modern day feel of prostitution. And, you know, interestingly enough, there did seem to be, you know, it seems to be the same experience um, from what I read. Um, and um, there was also um, a novel, a Chinese novel called The Sing Song Girls of Shanghai, I believe, which was um, a novel written in China, I think in the 1940s, and it was recently translated, and it was all set in a brothel, so I, I relied on that a little bit too. But it was basically just, you know, relying on a few sources, talking to people when I could, and, uh, and just trying to fill in the gaps through imagination, which is largely what the book ended up being. <laughs> I cannot, no. I read some Japanese, um, and so that helps because the characters are, are oftentimes the same, so you can get a sense of whether you're on the right page or not. Um, but for, for important sources, I would have um, a translator translate things for me. Um, and also do research on the internet and stuff because so, it was just, you know, much, much faster that way. Did you live in Shanghai? I had lived, um, I'd, I'd lived in Hong Kong and had made several trips to Shanghai in my early 30s. So I wasn't able to actually go for this project, just a combination of finances and the fact that I had two <laughs> small children, <laughs> as we know, <laughs> kept, me from, uh, kept me from going. Um, but I was able to kind of rely on contacts that I made and uh, to, you know, um, just I had a good sense of the city just from wandering around it and from living in Hong Kong and I'd also spent some time in Shenzhen and Guangzhou and, and other Chinese cities. So, you know, it helped me feel a little less intimidated about setting a novel in that scene. Thank you. <laughs> you know, 
Well, I think it's, I, I have a long-standing interest in women in the arts. I think that's part of it. Um, I'm also fascinated by the cultural intersections in art. You know, what happens when two very different cultures sort of clash and merge or combine, and the, the art forms that can spring from that. Um, so I think it was the combination of seeing that this, this woman had, you know, melded both forms into such a, for me, and again, I'm a very untutored art historian, but um, I, I just really was affected by her work. I thought it was quite lovely. And then to read her story and see that it had come from such a completely grim set of circumstances, that she'd had such a difficult life, and that despite all of these things that were set against her being a woman in China, which, you know, was not easy to begin with, and then being a prostitute and a sexual slave and um, then a concubine, and yet somehow she'd, she'd overcome all these things. And, went on to create beautiful art. I just felt that that was such an amazing story. And it made me want to not only know more about her, but I felt like people had to know about her. I, I pulled my husband over and I said, why does nobody know about this woman? <laughs> and he said, well, they should, and you should write her story. And I was like, I told him he was nuts because I didn't think that it was at all within my scope. Um, but the idea just never went away. I just kept on trying to write other things that seemed safer. and, and um, they weren't very interesting to me. So eventually I finally did, after my first child was born, I finally sat down very early one morning and, uh, and just started to see if I could do this and, and then just got hooked on the process. Hmm? Oil <laughs> that, was, that was proven several times as I tried to learn how to oil paint um, for this. I, I'm not very good at visual art, but I, I do think that um, you know writing can be an art form in its own way. And interestingly enough, from talking to other um, figurative artists um, whom I know, the process seems somewhat similar. That you kind of have an idea, you etch it out, you refine it, you use different tones and nuances, and um, so in that way, I suppose I am. But I, I could never do anything like this. I don't think. Thank you very much. As you can see, this is the first time that I've had an opportunity to even ask Jennifer anything about the book, and there are a lot of questions. I find it so intriguing when somebody is um, riveted by a story like this and um, then makes the kind of commitment and, and comes up with a wonderful, wonderful uh, readable and enjoyable and heart-wrenching, really, book. Very descriptive and quite beautiful. So it's on sale at the bookstore, and Jennifer will be downstairs signing. And I'd like to thank you all for coming and wish you a very happy holiday and a happy new year and look forward to having you come back to the center for our various programming uh, beginning in January. Thanks very much. <laughs>